Good evening. I was born and raised in Youngstown, Ohio, pretty much an all-American boy, the oldest child of a large Irish Catholic family, the favorite grandson, nephew, grandnephew. My brother's not here, is he? Um, son of an Irish hero in the Irish-American community of Youngstown who died at an early age, the age of 42. All of a sudden, I was forced to become the man in the family with five younger brothers and sisters. I started work actually at 13 as a janitor, trying to help the family out and do what I could to keep the family together. In school, I played all the sports. I was a spelling bee champ, National Honor Society. I was an altar boy at church, a boy scout, student government, hall monitor, the whole works. I had the good fortune to attend Cardinal Mooney High School, a prestigious private school in Youngstown, and then the University of Notre Dame, and Akron Law School. Upon graduation, I moved here to Columbus and became an assistant attorney general at the age of 23. After a few years, I moved back to Youngstown and had a short but successful legal career and at 37, I was elected a Youngstown Municipal Court judge. I taught criminal justice at Youngstown State University, was active in my church and many neighborhood and community groups, and I was an extremely popular, well-respected public figure with the whole future ahead of me. I had this very bright and promising future that was. And then I became known to the federal government as former inmate number 674-156-0808. It destroyed my life. I was a golden boy, and now I was in disgrace. It was a very difficult thing to have to, to live with. I did 20 months in custody. I'd resigned my law license before I was disbarred and did the best that I could. After prison, I finally got out and had to return to reality. Sometimes that was even more difficult than prison. The hardest thing was just to find a job, trying to help support your family, try to make a name for yourself again. It's very difficult. Even though people say that they want to help people get, get a second chance, that they understand, they forgive you, they know you, they like you, they still weren't willing to hire an ex-felon. I went from one job to another, part-time, temporary. My first job was as part-time caterer's assistant for minimum wage. It was quite a transition for such an exalted position to making a few bucks a week, trying to, again, try to help my family. I continued on that way, and it just wasn't work. Sometimes it really was worse than prison. The disappointment, the anxiety, the bitterness. Sometimes I cried, still do. Frustration, embarrassment, feelings of inadequacy, failure. I felt sorry for myself. You know, when I went to prison, I knew what my time was going to be. I accepted my sentence and was prepared to do that time and not let the time do me. Thinking that when I got out, I would have the opportunity to end that nightmare and to get on with my life. But it didn't work out that way, and it usually doesn't. My nightmare continued. All this effort trying to find jobs just unsuccessful, partly because of Youngstown being pretty economically depressed anyway and whatever, I decided that the best way for me would be to go back to school, thinking I might have an answer there. So I went back to Kent State University, getting a master's degree in, in criminal justice and a PhD in public policy. And the job market, for criminal justice, 
I'm as qualified as anybody maybe in the country. Multiple postgraduate degrees, experience as a prosecutor, defense lawyer, assistant attorney general, judge, taught criminal justice for 10 years. Plus, I had been through the entire process myself, being a criminal defendant, being in several penal institutions, several rehabs, halfway house, probation, done it all. Who could possibly know the system better than me? Still no luck. Don't know why, but nobody ever responded. I remember there was one job in, in Youngstown, at Youngstown State University, where I had taught for 10 years the very classes that were being offered for, and to be taught by this teacher. And by the way, I was the most highly rated professor in the department during those 10 years. Very effective, very popular. It was a tough grader, still was popular. So I didn't even get an interview. I had more you know, significantly more qualifications than the minimum requirements for the job. Frankly, more qualifications than the person who got it. And they wouldn't even interview me because of my record. It doesn't make sense. We would think that someone had gone through all that could really teach these kids something, but they wouldn't even talk to me. Hundreds of letters, applications, resumes. I got one response from a school, small branch campus down in southwest Ohio. I went there and they told me, that they had narrowed it down to two candidates. Really, I was what they wanted, but there was two candidates. And number two left town. He had, he had gotten a job at a much better university, much higher pay, and I said, okay, that's great. I went down and did a teaching demonstration. And I knocked it out of the park, really, it was fantastic. People were coming in, teachers and students, out of the hallways to hear me give a, a talk on intellectual property. Not exactly, you know, the most exciting. I had no slides. <laughs> I was just talking about copyright infringement, you know, and people were loving it. Of course, I got the job, right? They voted to highly recommend me to the main campus, and they vetoed that recommendation for the usual record, you know, the usual reasons, my record. I began to think that this isn't working out very well either. And you know? so, reluctantly, I left academia with really much disappointment and regret that I still feel today. Not only was it a waste of my time, effort, money, broke my hopes, it was something I really wanted to do. I was good at it, but it wasn't meant to be. So I had to make my own way. I had to change the perception of who Pat Kerrigan was and what he was doing and what he could do for our community. Nobody was going to hire me, so I ended up creating three different public service agencies. One was a, now the Mahoney County Land Bank. I was the first director, helped start it, did a great job running it. But when the board was prepared to hire me on a full-time basis, our local newspaper, I mean, and I didn't kill anybody. I didn't do anything like really outrageous. I didn't steal a million dollars. When I went to get that job, they wrote an editorial condemning the choice. And I'd been successful in doing the job and they condemned it. They ended up letting me go. I started and I got let go. Started another organization, starting to think, well, returning citizens, People that are getting out of prison need some help. So I started a reentry referral service center called Home for Good. Now, it's still successful. I still work with them. But it was a non-paying position, so I had to move on. But it's something that I'm proud of, of, of getting started. I moved on and started a third agency called the Oak Hill Collaborative, which is a neighborhood revitalization center, as was noted in one of the most socially, economically distressed areas literally in the state. It has the lowest, if not one of the lowest at least, uh, census tract, poverty rates, great unemployment, abandoned homes. And we're just doing what we can. We do neighborhood beautification, community organizing. We run a small business incubator, and we run a makerspace. And I like to say we, but I'm the only employee. 
we get a lot of volunteers that are, that are willing to help and invest in what we do. But it's privately funded. We don't get any government money for this. And it's really a breath of fresh air in that particular neighborhood. And so I'm feeling like I can, I can, I'm paying back. I'm proud to say that I was given a second chance. I paid my debt, and now I'm able to help others less fortunate than me. And it's something that, that I hope to continue to do, and it gives me a purpose in my life. But despite all my talk about myself, I'm not here just to talk about me. You know, in this country, we have almost 2.5 million people behind bars. We have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the people in prison and jail. We are by far the most punitive society on the planet. And there's all sorts of reasons why, but those numbers just don't seem to jive. But you know, I'm not here to talk about that 2.5 million either, but about the 700,000 that get let out of prison and jails every year. 700,000 people come out. Most of them totally unprepared for life in the real world. They don't have the same privileges that I did. Even if I had to change my perception, their perception is even worse to many people. So how are they going to get going? Fifty percent of the people that we let out of prison go back within one year. It's staggering. The recidivism rate goes up to 75 percent after five years. So why, as a society, and why are they as returning citizens so unsuccessful. There's a lot of reasons for that, but large part is just the pathology of the centers of criminal activity that they return to. Remember, people return to where they came from. Same people, places, and things. They're going back to neighborhoods of concentrated poverty with extremely high rates of incarceration and extremely low rates of employment especially among African-American males. Generations of welfare dependency, broken homes, inadequate schools, drug abuse, mental illness with inadequate treatment facilities. The list could go on. But this is what the people that are getting out of prison have to look forward to. Returning citizens have other issues as well. You know, to them, a very real issue is when you go to prison, you lose your license, you, you know, or you've lost your license because you haven't paid, or you've been driving without insurance, or you have all these issues. So transportation is huge. They have no car, no license, no insurance. They can't get to and from work. Sure, if they wanted to individually, that perhaps they could do it, but it's always not that easy. Not everybody has the same determination and drive that someone like Brad does. We're talking about 700,000 people. Most of them can't drive. They can't get to work or back. They can't get to their doctor's office. They can't get to the probation officers. And housing is another major issue. Most landlords, even many public housing authorities, won't rent to ex-felons. They won't even let them on the premises. So now that's a problem. They really do have to go back to the same places. See, I was fortunate. Believe me, unlike my brothers and sisters that are also getting out of prison, I had a nice home in a good neighborhood, safe. I had good education with job skills, some money in the bank, car and a driver's license, good health, good health insurance, a loving wife, supportive family, friends, whether or not they helped me so much, but at least they weren't hanging out on the corners getting into trouble. And I was white, a white male. There's a whole lot of privilege going on there, and I know it, and I thank God for it. But if I had difficulty, think about those people that are being left out that have less privilege than me, who are much less fortunate than I am. They're going to have a lot of trouble. So there's so many things that we could do, and I just want to put a face on 
reentry, a face on a returning citizen. I am a returning citizen. Hopefully this will help change your perception. There's a lot of things that we can do. We can change some of the laws, sentencing laws in particular, so we don't lock people up and send them away for seven, eight, ten years for, for dealing drugs when that's the only business that's readily available to them. And now we permanently break up their homes, their families, teach them nothing how to, except how to go back on the streets when they get back out. We have licensing laws. In, in, in Ohio, for example, there are 750 licenses or occupations that an ex-felon cannot get. No reason, no, re no relation to the, either to the crime or, or to the occupation, no time limit. So that for what I did, happened 25 years ago, the activities, I can't get a barber's license, ever or any other license of those 50, 750 licenses. It makes no sense. There are other things as well that I hope that if we have a dialogue and people start thinking about trying to help just in terms of reentry and rehabilitation, there's so much more that needs to be done there. You know, traditionally, these ideas, these reforms, were, were championed by, by Democrats and liberals, bleeding hearts, if you will. But things are starting to change. Fiscal conservatives now, people like Governor John Kasich, the Koch brothers, I'm sure many of you have heard of them, right on crime, other national groups, are all starting to recognize that it's a much more effective use of taxpayers' money to spend it on rehab and reentry than it is on prison. That's a pretty powerful combination. We're starting to see some progress in that area. So I hope that in a public policy way, we can make some changes there. But I also ask you as individuals to look inside your, your soul, look inside your heart. Virtually everybody here would say, oh yeah, I believe in second chances. Yeah. Would you hire somebody? Would you really give them a second chance? That's what they need. They don't need some big law passed. They need one-on-one -on -one help. And I hope that you'll give them that legitimate second chance. Thank you very much.